Today's topic is be found. That sounds like a very strange word, be found. But when we break it down, it, it's it's like an acronym that um, something spells something different than what the real um, message is about. Be found is be fruitful and multiply. And uh, on Wednesday, we started this subject talking about evangelism. We began the series with uh, the title Be Firm. And since many of you were not there on Wednesday, the, the Holy Spirit told me that I need to talk about the word today. Perhaps it will challenge those of you who have never felt in your heart the need to be in Bible study on Wednesday evening, that this will challenge you to purpose. Hey, there's something here. It's not the same old, same old that we go through. You know, we send a few courses, we do a word of prayer, yeah. and then we, we, we study yeah. the book of Acts, and then we do word verses from the book of Acts, and then we will go home. But we want to go deeper than that, because God has called us and has given us a mission. When we talk of a mission statement, you go into these different places of business. You go to BTL, BTL. On the wall, there's a statement there that says, what is the mission of this particular organization? Okay. Basically, their mission is to please their customers, Amen. to make sure customers are satisfied. And every employee is yeah, supposed to subscribe yeah. to that mission yeah. statement that we're here to please our customers. Anywhere you go, uh, and uh, we mentioned a couple of BTL, B, uh, BEL, we mentioned the Social Security Board, or even some other businesses you can go, and you find it spelled out clearly what your mission statement is all about. In the first book of the Bible, which is Matthew, we read where God gave a special mission to Adam and Eve. He says, be found, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. And then we go back to the New Testament and we find also in the first book of the New Testament, God is delivering the same message to his disciples and uh, it is written in a different form, but it is the same message. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. In the first instance, God was telling Adam and Eve, that you are going to multiply from a biological point of view. In the second instance, God is saying to the disciples and he's saying to us that we are going to multiply not only from a biological point of view, but we're also going to multiply from a spiritual point of view. So then we should have a mission statement. Our mission statement is uh, that I will do everything I possibly can so that I can be found in a uh, part of this mission statement that God has given his church. That we are to be fruitful, we are to multiply, we are to do exactly what his word has told us to do. Every now and then in a workplace, you find some workers who do not care about about what the mission of their uh, of their particular company is. And so they are there uh, to keep law and order. They are there to make sure that nothing goes wrong, but they're not there to please the customer. We heard a very interesting testimony this past week where uh, a, a sister was sick, and a friend of hers took her to the, to the hospital, right here in Belize. And after the doctor had given his diagnosis and he said, she's ready for an operation right now, we hear her, we're going to take her in for the operation. So the sister says, doctor, can you explain what it is all about? You know, give me a, a clearer picture of why she has to have this operation right away. He says, I am the doctor here. I have the final say. And whatever I say, that is the final decision concerning the situation. But he wasn't thinking about his mission statement at all. He was simply thinking that I'm the boss. I'm the one in charge. Don't question me. Believers are not to act after those manners. Believers are supposed to be humble people, people who are responsive to whatever questions that come our way. The Lord is looking at the church and the mission that he has given to us. 
And he says the, 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 the directions now are, have changed a little bit. You, and then we read the Psalm 127, where the psalmist says, you know, talking about the Lord building the house and uh, his blessings upon the home. And he said, blessed is a man who has his quiver full, meaning a house full of children. But we're not pursuing that anymore. Uh, the, the average children in, in some countries, and I don't know how they arrive at this, but two and a half is the average uh, uh, number of children for the household. Uh, don't ask me how they arrive at that, 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 that number. But God has given us this mission to save the lost. The word of God in St. John says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as he challenged the disciples, he says, I've walked with you for some three and one half years. I've led you by example. I haven't only spoken to you and told you verbally what I, what I want from you, but I've led you by example. I sat where the lost sat. I sat where the sick sat. I walked where considered no bodies. And uh, I showed no difference at all in, in my treatment of them. And he says, I want you to go and do the same. He says, I have all power. All power is given unto me. And uh, I am giving this power unto you. Sometimes we live so far beneath our privileges that we give the credit to the enemy. And we say, the enemy is this. The enemy is that. The enemy is the other. Oh, a people also said the, the, the devil made me do it. And we give him all kinds of credit. But God wants us to move away from that mentality. And God wants us to move to the place where we leave our comfort zone. And we say, Lord, I am going to be about the mission that you have assigned to me. I, when things go wrong, as they many times will, I am not going to give the credit to the enemy, but I'm saying this is just a bend in life's road. It is just a, a small little hindrance, but there are greater blessings as I press on with you, and you will enable me, Father, to be successful in everything that I say and everything that I do. When we think of the need to reach people for the Lord, we realize that there's a need for discipleship. Not only do we seek them, not only do, do we win them and say, well, now they're a part of the New Testament congregation, hallelujah, that's it. But then we need to disciple them. We need to teach them that what they have received from the Lord, they will also pass on to others. The Apostle Paul was a good example of that. Yes, he was writing there to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 and around the 23rd verse. The apostle said, I have delivered unto you that which I have received from the Lord. Anytime the apostle Paul was speaking uh, from his own thoughts, from his own um, impressions, uh, he says, I have said this uh, because God gave me permission to say it. But when God gave him something directly that was from God himself, Paul admitted, it is not me. It is God who has given this word to me. And so our responsibility is that we need to teach those who are just coming into the fold to how to grow spiritually, how to move away from the milk stage, how to go to the level where they are eating the sincere meat of the word of God. When you're practicing what 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says, study to show yourselves approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so when we look at the word of God, we're not interpreting the word from the way uh, those learned theologians are interpreted. Because when they look at scriptures like the dividing of the Red Sea, cross in the River Jordan, they have a logical explanation for it. When they talk about the walls of Jericho falling down, they have a logical explanation for it. It was this stomping of the feet of the, of the people marching around the wall that weakened the ground. And after when they blew the trumpet, the wall fell down. Well, we know that that is not the way it happened. It was God who caused the wall of Jericho to fall down after the people were obedient and they walked around the wall the number of times that God, God told them. How many times uh, did they walk around? Okay, you're not going to miss that. 
30 times. Six days, once each day, and on the seventh day, seven times around the walls of Jericho. One, the great theologian said, when you think of the Red Sea, when you think of the Jordan uh, being able for the people to walk across it, it was because of the season, uh, the time of the season, when the tide was low. And so they were able to walk through, and uh, they, they, were, uh, they were able to get to the other side. And someone asked the question, well, you know, when you talk of the Red Sea and uh, it being a uh, low tide, how did it bring the entire affairs army? It had to have been the work of God. And so we, we put aside all those learned uh, teaching that, uh, that, they, that they've tried to present to us, and we go back to the Word of God, and we look at what God has given to His church the message or the mission that God has committed to us. The question that we must ask ourselves, are we missing the mission? Have we shut our arrows so far ahead that we miss the target completely? Our mission is to reach every soul in the country of Belize, everyone that God's put within the sound of a Voices, we should have a heart of compassion for them and we should be endeavoring to reach them with love for the Lord. No, not everyone, not everyone will accept the message. They, they, they did some studies and they found that many years ago an individual just needed to be talked to or to be witnessed to by maybe one or two persons before he can give their heart to the Lord. And as time moved on and people became wiser, as people became more knowledgeable, it took more than two or three times talking to them to give themselves to the Lord. Sometimes it took a catastrophe before they would yield themselves to the Lord and recognize, yes, this is God calling me and I must yield to his call upon my life. We have to learn that the church is not a country club. You know, very often churches become clannish where we minister only to our own. We uh, have communication only with those who are like ourselves. But the church is not a country club, it's at least not New Testament church. We should not ever try to imitate uh, the things that go on in country clubs. Number one, country clubs are exclusive. You've gotta be at a certain level in life in order to pay the fees, because there's a fee that goes along with belonging to a country club. You have to be somebody uh, uh, in your community. They don't just allow anybody to come in and say, I want to be a member of your club. But anyone who can meet that standard where you live in, your salary, your bank account, those are the criteria that they're looking at. The church does not look at that. The church sees it differently. There are no fees for joining the church. There are no incidentals. Every now and then, when an emergency comes up, we ask you for an extra offering. But beyond that, we don't press you to ask you to go more than God's word has um, given for us to go. Right. There are congregations that not only demand a tithe of 10%, but they demand 20% of the earnings. And um, we don't even demand the time. It is God who speaks to your hearts and let you know that the time belongs to God. And so in obedience to God, not in obedience to the church, but in obedience to God, you set aside 10% of what God has blessed you with, and you bring it and you give it for the ministry of the church. So there are no membership fees. There are no incidentals that, that you have to measure up to. Country clubs are designed for, to keep have-nots out and to keep the haves in. But God does not look at it from that perspective. God does not look at the have and the have not and says, you I select, you I reject. God look at every one of us and God sees every one of us at one point in our lives as being lost and undone. Far from God, far from his son. And he reached on his loving hand of compassion and he snatched us as brand from the burning. And because we have been snatched as brand from the burning, the commission from God is to go and snatch others who are being uh, burnt up in the, in, in the things that this world has to offer, they're being consumed. And your job and my job is to reach them for the Lord. The songwriter says, just as uh, 
said, a lifeline was thrown up to you when you were when you were drowning there in, in the sea of all the things that this world has to offer. He said, throw the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Throw the lifeline in there. What God has given to us is the lifeline of his word. And we have the responsibility to share it with everyone we come in contact with. We have to understand that we are different. God's church is not exclusive. There are no rec um, there, there are no, what is the correct word? There, there are no obligations, there are nothing that we have to do other than come as we are. No requirements. There are no requirements other than come as you are and say, Lord, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Lord, us undone. I need your son to take over my life. And by surrendering to him, those are the only requirements that God has for us. When the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, man, what must I do to be saved? They didn't tell him you've got to be baptized. You've got to be going to the first church in Jerusalem. You've got to be a tithe payer. They never said any of those things. They simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and in thy house. And men and women and boys and girls, everyone is included. When God made a promise to the Jeanette family, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your children likewise. They might not come at the time when you expected that they would have surrendered their life to the Lord, but because we're believing, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that by training up the children in the way they should go, when they're old, they'll have to come back and reflect upon what the parents taught them, and they will say, I need to give my life to the Lord. Amen. Thank God for His Word. Thank God for what He is doing through His Word in our churches today. The church's mission involves reconciliation. The church is a family of believers. Each one is at a different stage in their spiritual life. There are some who are newborn. They have just come into the fold. There are those who have been there for a while. They've been in, in this way for a long time. And then there are those who are ready to step off the scene. But whatever stage we are at, we are all a part of the family of God. The Gators wrote that beautiful song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. He goes on to talk about the things that take place in the family of God. Each of us, because we're members of this family, we are, we are fully grounded in family life. We've said it over and over again, that in the family, those members of the family have access to the thing that's in the home. There are a few exceptions. Um, uh, the man and myself were talking yesterday, and we said there are some children who have let us down. They have done some things that, that are not displeasing to us. And so you draw the line and you say, yes, your family, you're welcome in this home, in, in this home but that room is limits to you. That other room is off limits to you. They're going to come to see what they can get a hold of and, and to take it off so that they can go and, and, and sell it because of some habit that they have. We leave the home open at all times to family members. And when we say the doors of this church are open, we mean they are open. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you're welcome into the New Testament family because God has designed it that way. There are no outsiders. There are none who do not belong here. We're all members of the family of God. So in a family, we care for each other. It's only a rare situation when you find the mother is opposed to the child and the father is opposed to the mother and there's fussing and fighting and all those things. That is not normal. But in a normal family, there's a caring for each other. And in the church, there should be a caring for each other. When one has a heartache, we all have a care and rejoice in each victory of this family so dear. So when my brother, when my sister is down, we don't say, God bless you, go your way. We have a prayer with them, and we ask, how can we help you? What do we can do to, to, to meet you, to help you to get across this obstacle that is being thrown in your pathway? Hospitality is not a transaction. It is not, I'm going to do for you 
because of what you can do for me. But hospitality is relational. In other words, I care, I am hospitable towards you because you are re related to me. We are relative. We are related to the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't care what ethnic group you're, group you're from. I don't care what status you have in life. We are relative because of the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us white as snow and makes us one in the Spirit of God. So it is not transactional. Now what I can get. Look at Luke 14, uh, around uh, verses 12 to 14. And you'll see a situation there that, that Jesus uh, brought to the attention of, uh, of his hearers. Luke chapter 14. And we're looking at verses 12 to 14. transactional um, hospitality or relational hospitality. If you invite those, the Bible says, if you invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters or your rich neighbors, they may invite you back and then you'll be repaid. And so you are engaged in transaction where I give my hospitality to you and I expect that it'll be reciprocated. It, it'll come back. Jesus says that's not what the church's mission is about. The church's mission, he says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. We know that they, that they, they the Lord tells us that the waste of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And so when we give God our service, when we give our all to him, everything, holding back nothing, God says, you are a servant of mine. You are expected to go out to feed the poor, the hungry, to help those who are poor, to do whatever you can so that they can come to know you, come to know his life eternal. Um, I don't remember if it's here that we talk about the Salvation Army, but as a reminder that the S means you feed them first. Then you give them that which they need in order to improve them, themselves physically. And then you give them the Word of God. So when we are taking a ministry to those who are lost, those who are outside of the fold, you don't say, I'm going to talk about God to you first. I'll make sure that you are in the position where you can listen to what I have to say. And, uh, you know, we, we, we lose sight of that. We don't want to lose sight of the mission. The mission is to reach the lost for you, to be fruitful, to multiply, and replenish what God has given to us. Our Lord is the best example, the very best example when we come to relational experiences. Look at John 4. And we're all familiar with this story in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, that our Lord was going to go, he was going to a certain city. And uh, the Word of God says, he must needs pass through Sychar, verse 4. Now he had to go to Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was not the time when ladies normally come to the well to draw water. And so the first thing we notice about Jesus is that he was intentional. There's nothing that he does that is accidental. That he does it well, uh, this is perchance them doing it. But it was planned. 
This was at high noon when the ladies had already come well, when they had taken their, their, their jars, filled it with water, and they had gone back to their home. There was one citizen in the city of Sychar who was an outcast. She was not welcomed by the rest of the community because she was a woman of ill repute. But the word of God says Jesus knew that she was coming to the well. She purposely did not come when the others were there because they looked at her with scorn. They had remarks to say about her. And so she waited until the, the air was clear and she came to the well. Jesus intentionally planned to be there for he knew that this woman was there, would be there. He knew that she was needy. He knew that she was despised. She was a Samaritan. The Samaritans were half Jews, half Gentiles. They were hated by the Jews. They were hated by the Gentiles because they're just what, what we describe as half free. They were not welcome in the Jewish community. They were not welcome in the Gentile community. And so the city of Sychar was populated by Samaritans, people who were or the outcasts. And so this woman came to the well. You know, isn't it amazing that although they were all a despised people, yet they found someone that they could look down upon. That is the nature of human nature. No matter, we're all in the same level, we're all in the same boat, but we'll find something about someone that we can pick up and something we can criticize them about. And so the Samaritan woman, she had had four husbands. She was about to get married, perhaps, to another one. And the Jesus knew all about this. So he says, I am going to wait until he got there. He chose the hour that she would be there. We also notice not that he was only intentional, but he was relational. In other words, he related to everyone with whom he came in contact. He related to the outside, to the despised, to the rejected persons, and he broke all protocols. Protocols says that a Jew does not talk to a Samaritan. A male Jew does not approach a, a, a woman from another race, or even women, and have a conversation with them. He broke all the rules, and he, when she came, you open the conversation. She was minding her own business. I am not concerned about who is sitting there. He's a Jewish gentleman, and uh, I'm surprised that he's here. But I'm going to go ahead and fill my pail anyway, and then I'll go about my business. But Jesus broke all the protocols, and uh, he addressed her. And she was shocked. He says, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. That is not the norm. Jews do not talk to Samaritans. And Jesus says, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you would really, really stop and listen to what I have to say. And then she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well. So, you know, we go back to ancestral uh, benefits and we say, this is my mother's church. This is my father's church. We laid the cornerstone for this building. And therefore, as a grandchild of that person, I am entitled to have a say in this church. Folks look back and they, they claim their ancestors right, that that right comes down. But guess what? God has no grandchildren. Every one of us have to be children of God. You do not inherit your salvation based upon mother's um, salvation. You do not receive it based upon your father's salvation. And as we're talking about birthdays this morning, I am, um, my, my mind raced back. My dad was born in 1899. He would have been 120 years yesterday had he lived. That was the age where, 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 where Moses died. And I knew he wouldn't have been around that, that long. But you remember him on Byron this day. He was born on Byron this day. And um, born in uh, March 9th, 1899. That's a lot of years. Way, way back, right? But we don't dwell upon fathers and their ancestors. Oh, another story comes to my mind. My dad is never a home. There's a seaman who was away for years, for months and months and months. And when he came to town, he was for maybe a few days or a week or something like that. Well, <clears throat> Haddonville 
Had he had just been destroyed, and if the city had been destroyed, and Haddyville was just being built. So we would go out there, we would have services, you know, we'd pick a, a, a night, and then we'd get a bus load of us, and then we'd go uh, to church in Haddyville. My dad happened to be in town that week. And uh, I was going to be the speaker in Haddyville. No, no, remember, but he's never wrong. And um, so the missionary, I introduced him to the mission, and said, this is my dad. The missionary being um, the one who is uh, handing a compliment, said, you know, your son is a great preacher. You know what my dad said? I know. You know. But that is family. And no matter what folks say, family, we're going to stand up. He never heard me preach. He was never around for any of that. But he said, I know that he's a good preacher. Yeah, that's family, right? So Jesus was relational. He spoke to this despised woman. He told her about the gift that he had. He said, if you knew the gift of God, that the water that I have, uh, you know, you will not thirst again. And so she began to relate that to the natural water. Remember we talked about Nicodemus last week when Jesus talked about being born again. Nicodemus says, oh, how can it happen? I can't go back to my mother's womb because he was thinking in the natural. And so the Samaritan woman was here also thinking in the natural. Give me the water. I don't have to come back here so I can and have the other women staring at me. I don't have to come back here so that um, sarcastic remarks can be thrown at me. I want that water that I'll never thirst again. And Jesus told her that the gift of God is not natural water, but it is springing, it is spiritual water that is springing up as a well of life into each and every one of our hearts. So he related to her and he explained exactly what she was missing in her life. This is part of a mission. If you don't know how to lead a soul to Christ, let's discuss it. Let's go over, uh, you know, do some practice sessions so that you can know how to approach individuals to, to challenge them about the gospel that God has committed to you. So you can know that whatever you're quoting to them is scriptures that you know yourself. You're not going to give them a scripture and tell them to look it up, and then when they look it up, it's not the correct scripture that you're quoting. You're going to memorize, you're going to hide the word in your heart, so that when you talk to someone else about him, you'll be able to say, this is what John 3, 16 says. This is what Jeremiah 33, 3 says. This is what Genesis 1 and 28 says, Matthew 28 and 18, you'll, you'll be able to quote what the Word of God says. And then uh, know beyond the shadow of the upper dot, if you tell it, turn in your Bibles, then they're going to find exactly what you've been talking about. But it doesn't just happen overnight. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as young people, we used to have these superstitions. And that if you're studying for an exam, one of the best ways to, to really know the subject is to put it on your pillow at night and you sleep on it and the words are going to be transferred to you. No superstitions the Bible You don't put the Bible under the pillow and you find that it will be transferred into your brain. You have to read it for yourself. You have to understand what the Bible is saying. Hide it in your heart. Be able to share it with someone else. So let's practice this. We, we, we must be intentional. We're going to look for opportunities everywhere we go to talk to souls about the Lord. We must be relational. We don't look at them and say, I don't think he's going to receive this because, and the because is always um, a fallacy. No one knows exactly what is going to take place when the word of God is sown. The word of God tells us that all souls uh, so, so Apollos um, waters, but it is God that gives the increase. So you speak to a soul about the Lord. You challenge them about accepting the Lord into their life, and they do nothing about it. Someone else comes by and water those seed that were planted in the heart of those individuals, and then God gives the increase, cause that individual to begin to realize that I need him because without him, I am absolutely nothing. And then Jesus exposed the fourth world view of this woman. He had a world view that this world is sacred because it was given to us by our father Jacob. We, he had a world view that it is okay 
I'll go on this fast. It doesn't matter the lifestyle that I'm living. Uh, you know, God somehow will overlook me. And there are other falsehoods that she might have been entertaining. It is okay, okay to call this person my husband when he's really not my husband. And Jesus said, go call your husband. And uh, she hesitated. She, he says, yeah, I know why you hesitated. Because you had four. And this one that you have right now is not even your husband. And she says, you must be the Messiah that we heard about. But Jesus was so open, was so kind, so confident to her that she drank in every word that he had to say. And then she left her water pot and she ran back into the city to tell others what Jesus had done for her. When he does something for you, you forget the thing that you thought were important. She thought, you know, we would say water, that was important. It is one of the staff of life. We, we cannot do without water. But because the word of God had been so indelibly printed in her heart that she forgot her water pot that she says, I've got a mission. I've got to go and let others know that the Messiah is here. And the crowds came. And after he spoke to them, uh, they said to her, we believe, not just because of what you said, but because we have spoken to him ourselves, and we have heard the word of life from him. He dispelled, he exposed all the world views that you have. What thing are you holding on to today that can be described as nothing less than superstition? Uh, some people believe, uh, you know, that if, I, if I'm good enough, uh, that's going to give me salvation. If I give alms, if I pay my tithe, that is going to earn me salvation. If I love my neighbor, that is going to be sufficient for God to, uh, to, to, to um, allow me to come into his kingdom. Those are all good, but the basic requirement that God has given to us, that God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and the son brother says, whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, whosoever mean, uh, surely meaneth me, it surely means me. Not you, not the other person, but I am the one who stands in need of salvation. And each of us must that for ourselves. So all the false views that you've been holding on to, there are those who say, we don't have to come to church because we, we get all this um, teaching on the radio. TBN has all these different messages. And as you listen to TBN, one, one um, preacher is saying, do this and uh, you're going to be rich. The other one says, do this and you're going to be wiser. And everybody has a different message. But the one true message is, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. No if and so buts about it. The Son of Man has come and he wants to have a relationship with every one of us. He restored her with the truth of the gospel. The word gospel means good news. When the angels spoke to the, uh, to the shepherd, they, uh, they, the word was we bring you good tidings or good news of great joy which shall be to all people. And she immediately gave her heart to Christ, went back and spoke to her people who came and gave their hearts to him right away. This is a mission. Whatever we lack, Christ admonishes us to ask, to seek, to knock. So let's embark on this mission of be from, be fruitful and multiply. We, God is looking for committed life. God is looking for men and women who are going to say, I want to learn more. I want to be uh, greater filled with, with the anointing that God has in store for me as his child, that I can have that passion, that burden, that when I look at the lost, I will not walk by and feel contented that uh, had he lived a better life, he, would, he wouldn't be in that position that he is right now. But we would have compassion at every lost soul we see around us. Not only compassion, but we'll look for opportunities to reach out to them and to tell them about the message of the gospel. It took persecution for the early Jerusalem church, the first church in Jerusalem, 
it took persecution for them to follow what Acts 1 8 said. And he shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. If persecution did not come, they would have been satisfied to stay in Jerusalem and have church. But when the persecution arose, the word of God says, the believers were scattered in every direction. And wherever they went, they preached the word and they taught the word. So persecution caught, caused them to fulfill the mission that God had originally given to them. You're, you're working in Jerusalem, but there's a work in Judea. There's a work in Samaria. There's a work in the uttermost part that you and you alone can do. Do you realize, beloved, if you and I don't do it, God can raise up someone else to do the work that has to be done. Why allow someone else to get the credit to have the joy of leading these souls to the Lord when you and I can be God's instrument to bring them to the church? We're going to preach the word with good, with glad tidings. Genesis says, be fruitful and multiply. Matthew says, go, be fruitful, multiply. Win them, look for them, win them, bring them back, disciple them, and make the sons of every soul who comes to us with them. The get us for the song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of life. I've been watching the family. I've been trans family. Join tears with Jesus as we carry with you. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of life. You will notice we say brother and sister down It's because we're family and folks are so dear. When one is a hearty, we all have a care and rejoice in each victory of this family's belief. Can God look down in the New Testament church and see that type of family? People who are relational, people who are intentional, People who have a heart, a burden for the lost, and they will not rest until souls have been won to the kingdom. I challenge you today. Search your eyes. And if you find that there's something there that is not conducive to what a Christian ought to be, you know, I want to turn it over to you today and let him have his way. such a concern for the most of us. And we can be fruitful. Not in the but in the name of him who gives life to you. Five years ago, Every one of us will be spend it to be spent with Jesus. We 
keep your list very clear. I have an example. In the name of Jesus, kill a fire in my heart that the world cannot consume. Give me a fresh burden. Give me a fresh passion for the lost. May I never be satisfied until my neighborhood come to you. Until I know that my city, my village, wherever I am situated, I've been touched with the power of your word. I pledge that I will do everything in my power to be a witness for you. To be fruitful is my mission. Thank you for helping me. In Jesus' name. We like to ten minute So uh, while we're picking up your offering, we're gonna sing I'm so glad my father. I'm so glad.